The most important part of the seed collecting is that those seeds are... Look at those cavities. Your tomatoes, you want to help them to avoid the blight. Don't plant them right next to your potatoes. Whatever you grow in your garden, the seeds you collect from those plants. Good morning and welcome to Willow's Green Permaculture. Today, I'd like to give you my recommendation between whether you should plant hybrid tomatoes next year or heirloom tomatoes. I'm gonna tell you about why for pretty well all of my life, I've always planted heirlooms and avoided hybrids. And why last year I planted, sorry, this year I planted hybrids for the first time and experimented with them. And now I'm gonna give you the results of my experimentations. But however, I'm gonna give you the pros and cons of each. Pros and cons of hybrids and the pros and cons of, of uh, heirlooms. So, let's get started. Let me tell you first why I've always liked to plant heirloom tomatoes. Didn't actually plant that many of them this year, but this is one of them right here. I've always, I've been gardening for 34 years. 35 years now, I've been gardening for 35 years straight. And I'd say, uh, I've, I've, I mean, I've always planted the heirloom tomatoes because they're the ones that have been around for, for centuries, handed down by families through time immemorial for all their best properties and so on. You know, the, the, the ones, best ones chosen each season and then passed on and improved upon and improved upon just by choosing the best tomatoes and their open pollinated gardens. And uh, that's when you say open pollinated, that means, you know, every, all the tomatoes can interbreed and so on. And so, uh, and they're just, the flavor is wonderful and so on. And so I've always planted heirlooms and I planted a wide variety of heirlooms. This is one, this is a, this is a watermelon beefsteak tomato. And uh, I've got here also growing back in here in my greenhouse. I've got these yellow pears. These are, this is the one kind that I've been growing the longest. I have been growing this since 1990, this one, the yellow pear, which is an heirloom. I love the heirloom tomatoes. They're wonderful, they're delicious, they're flavorful. Uh, however, last year, in 2023, the 1st of August, the tomatoes were doing great. Fantastic, the plants were bigger than me. They were all over the place. And then within 10 days, they were wiped out. They went from pristine to completely wiped out, totally rotten in about 10 days. They got the blight. And that was the first time in my life I, I had to deal with it. And uh, I was really, really disappointed because you know we love tomatoes around here Magali absolutely adores tomatoes and so I was kind of devastated and they were so rotten then that when I cleaned up the tomato area it, it, it literally almost made me sick sick to my stomach but uh, I managed I piled them all up right where I had planted them piled them all up there covered them in compost and said you know that's this is where they're gonna this is where they're they're gonna decompose and uh, over time just not going to plant tomatoes there again. Uh, maybe over time the, the blight will have uh, left from there. Who knows? I don't know. Or, or I'll, I'll have uh, developed, uh, let's say, uh, varieties that are resistant. So anyways, that was devastating. Very, very devastating. Now, the thing is, now, the main reason I think why that happened to me. Now, uh, I'm not an expert on the blight, but I'm told that, uh, it, you know, being a, a, an airborne fungus, so a spore, it comes with the wind, it comes with the rain, and apparently there are maps you can look at, interactive maps of North America, where you can watch it moving along the continent, and you can see it, see it, see it as, it, let's say, approaches your area, and you can be prepared for it. Uh, because one, one method of preparation for, for uh, the blight is to cover your tomatoes. So like, for instance, this year I planted my tomatoes, uh, some of my tomatoes in my greenhouse, they're covered here. Um, so anyways, but I think one of the reasons as well why they, they fell prey to the blight was because 
I didn't do with my tomatoes what I do with pretty well all of my other vegetables, and that is use companion planting and biodiversity. There were a good 100 plants, and that's all there was, was tomatoes. No carrots, no basil, no calendula, no lettuce, no nothing. None of these other plants that... Uh, that help repel anything that might bother tomatoes. And also, for instance, carrots will, they, they, they put out some kind of a natural chemical into the air that actually helps the tomato plant. And so, so I think that's one of the reasons why my tomato grew vulnerable to that. Uh, it, it apparently was also a vulnerable year. Uh, many people lost their tomatoes in 2023 in, in our area. Uh, however, we did get a few here and there that resisted. For example, right in almost in the center of that garden where we lost everything, we still got some of these. So, uh, and they were in the, like the, the epicenter of the blight in our garden. And then elsewhere in other smaller gardens where, you know, I'm always experimenting, trying, trying new spots. I had these things, uh, a few of these things that also survived the blight, which was great. So I, so I kept those seeds and, uh, and I replanted them this year. However, I didn't, I didn't plant, replant my heirlooms in the garden. So, because of that, I thought, okay, I will try the famous hybrid tomatoes that I had been avoiding for 30 years, or I don't know how long they've been in existence. And I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. And I, I bought a number of uh, hybrid tomato um, seeds to let's say uh, two or three different varieties maybe four now here's the first disadvantage I discovered right away when I bought them well right away when I opened the packet the packets I bought cost me seven dollars each plus tax and uh, in each packet of tomato seeds there were between seven and nine seeds so that's about a buck per seed uh, wow you don't want to lose any of your seedlings in these guys. And uh, whereas, you know, a typical heirloom packet will will run from between 25 and 150 seeds in a single regularly priced packet for like between five and seven bucks. If you want more, then you pay uh, bulk prices and so on. And so that was the first disadvantage. Now, of course, I got, I got hybrid uh, tomato seeds that were going to resist the blight. And, and the plants grew, and the plants grew well. I planted them all in the garden, not in the same spot where the other tomatoes had been, but not far from there. And sure enough, they did resist the blight, and they did quite well. And uh, I was very happy about that. And I've got a few examples of our hybrid tomatoes right here. So for instance, like here's, here's one of our heirlooms, and then here are a couple of our hybrids. A, uh, this is a you know, a plum type tomato, and this is just a, I guess, a large cherry tomato. I had another type that I don't have any left of, which was round like these cherry tomatoes, but but about uh, double the size of this guy. We did well. We we got we got quite a few of them, but they're all done now. Now it's actually October second today, and uh, we haven't had a frost yet, so our our um, that's our heirloom tomatoes are all still doing really really well. Uh, lots of green ones. I'm going to pick a couple in a few minutes. But our, our heirloom tomatoes are doing really, really well. A and they're still growing like crazy because when I buy the heirloom, I also buy what's called indeterminate. And that means they kind of grow really huge. They could, they could grow dozens of yards high or meters high if, if you let them, if you have the trellising for them. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, you know, they'll just... Any plant, whether it's indeterminate or determinate, any tomato plant will, if left to its own devices, will just grow all over the ground. And I'll show you some images of those, of some of our heirlooms that I let grow on the ground on our shinampas. Uh, even, even though they're all over the ground, because that was one of my experiments this year, I wanted to try some uh, planting some tomatoes in an area of the garden in an, uh, where I'd never planted before, and I wanted to just let them sprawl all over the ground. And I wanted it to be heirlooms because, you know, when you let tomatoes sprawl on the ground, then they are going to be uh, vulnerable to bugs, to disease, to the blight and so on. Because when it rains, all the, 
everything splashes up off the ground, off the soil and so on. So when I did see tomatoes developing on the ground, well, here are a couple from that area. I'd try and make sure that there were some leaves under there or something to put a, a space between the tomatoes and the ground. So, so anyways, I, all that to say, I don't have all my varieties of, of hybrids here because uh, they're done. They're basically done. They've been, uh, they, the, the, big, the bigger round ones have been done for about uh, at least a week now. And because uh, they're all determinate. And then these ones, they're, they're pretty well all done too. It's just maybe the cherry tomatoes, which I might get have maybe for about another week or so. Now, so the first, um, let's say, disadvantage of the hybrids is the fact that uh, the seeds are more expensive. The second one is the flavor. They are, they don't, they, they, they don't have anywhere near the delicious flavor, the sweetness of the heirlooms, you know, and also the, the, the rich, richness of the texture. It's basically skin and juice, which is great if that's what you want, but because it's basically just skin and juice inside, or skin and very, very simple pulp, um, what they do tend to have problems with sometimes is they'll start to have problems coming from the inside. Like this one looks like it's starting to get something on the inside so they might be resistant to blight but they're not resistant to everything uh now and and so uh, you have to kind of eat them more quickly otherwise uh, if, if you got them on the shelf uh for let's say or even in the fridge for more than a week they're going to start to go bad whereas heirlooms you can you can stick on the counter for a couple weeks and they'll be fine and if they're green well a couple months until they ripen now another thing i felt was odd about the hybrid tomatoes and I kept this dirty one to show you an example is now you could look at this what I'm about to say as an advantage or a disadvantage this was on the ground and there was no 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 bug bite nothing no bugs went after it it was really really dirty it was practically covered in dirt and leaves and all the rest of it and the bugs didn't go after it and and the same thing i've noticed that the same thing anytime that i picked up hybrid tomatoes off the ground they're really dirty covered in dirt and so on no bug bites whereas i don't have examples here but uh the uh, heirlooms that if they'd be on the ground they'd have bug bites in them if they were if they were in contact with the soil they invariably have bug bites but the thing about the heirloom is even like a big tomato like this it has a bug bite here you can take it if it's ripe cut that part out and everything else will still be amazing whereas the hybrids um as soon as they've got something that's going on with them then the whole tomato loses its flavor because it's basically it's, it seems to be like a, a skin and and like uh, and juice and so when one thing happens on one end it's going to affect the flavor on all ends I guess it's because these are so much bigger and more complex. Something happens on one end, you still got three quarters of your tomato. So that was, there was another disadvantage of the hybrids. So more expensive, the animals didn't seem to, the animals seemed to like avoid them like they weren't real or something. And uh, also the flavors, just not the same. And when they did start to, let's say, go bad, um, the whole tomato would be lost. Even if you got a one little like this here, for instance, it's starting to develop something and it's only been sitting on the counter a couple days, this is not gonna taste much good anymore. Whereas if you had this kind of spotting on, on something like this, you cut it off and the rest is delicious. So flavor, price, the fact that the animals seem to reject the, the hybrids and um, and, and a, a, shorter, a shorter shelf life as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, I should say that I only tried about three or four hybrid varieties and this is my first year. So, but I don't think I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back because the fifth disadvantage of a hybrid, and this is the most important one that I haven't mentioned, you can't collect the seeds. You know, seed collection is the most important part of farming, of permaculture, of gardening. 
growing your own food. And I'm not just talking about self-sufficiency here. I'm not talking about, you know, saving money. Collecting your seeds is how you make, first of all, it's how you, how you make your, the, the, the food you grow get better every year. But it's not only that. Whatever you grow in your garden, the seeds you collect from those plants will be adapted to your conditions. So you collect the seeds of your best vegetables and you replant them next year. Not only they're going to be examples of your best vegetables, not only you're not, you're not going to have to pay for them, but the most important part of the seed collecting is that those seeds are going to be adapted to your conditions and are going to do better no matter what. Not only are they going to do better because they were your best variety, but they're going to do better because from the start, from the start, they're going to be well adapted to your conditions. And so that's, that's really important to take into consideration. So there it is. Five disadvantages as far as I'm concerned to the hybrids. Flavor is not as good as the heirloom. The seeds are expensive. The animals seem to reject them outright. They don't have a long shelf life. If they have a little bit of an issue on them, then the whole tomato spoiled. And finally, you can't collect the seeds. And why is it you can't collect the seeds? It's because the babies of the, those tomatoes aren't gonna give you the same properties as those seeds that you bought as those seeds that you bought so if, if i take these yes these resisted the blight but if i take these seeds and i plant them next year they won't necessarily resist the blight they might resist the blight now heirlooms the heirlooms taste the best the heirlooms have been around the longest the heirlooms have the greatest diversity genetic diversity and uh, they're just the most delicious as far as flavor sweetness texture variety of flavors and so on you know and you get you got every size imaginable and every shape and so on and color they're just incredible well worth it now of course the main disadvantage is they are vulnerable to the blight so how do you prevent that? Well, one way is covering your tomatoes. So this year I planted them, I planted my heirlooms in this shed, in this, in my uh, greenhouse. So I got these ones, these um, watermelon beefsteak, and then these yellow pears. And I also got another variety here Chapas, right here, and they're just a cherry tomato, and um, they're heirloom. Now, I actually planted these out in the garden too, because these are, even though they're an heirloom, they're an heirloom that's naturally naturally resistant to the blight. And I have another one that I don't have here, but I'll show you some images of that I didn't bother planting in the greenhouse, and that is another another one called the. Uh, it's an heirloom, but it's also it's also resistant to the blight, and it's called coyote. So the the tomatoes are about exactly the same size as this. They're cherry, and but they're yellow. And they're resistant to the blight. So and and like I said, these heirlooms here, these uh, these yellow pears seem to be resistant to the blight as well. So it's just these heirloom, and probably many others that aren't. Um, but I planted them in, in my greenhouse. However, I also planted them on the Shinampa. So this one is from the greenhouse and it's really big. Now, what I found with my greenhouse tomatoes is they're not as juicy uh, because I never watered in here. I, ju I just wanted, I wanted to see if, because they weren't gonna get rain, I wanted to see how they do with zero watering because I don't water my gardens outside because they get rain. And I wanted to try zero watering in the greenhouse. And the thing is, under the greenhouse, there's a layer of gravel that, that uh, I put down before they came and installed the greenhouse. 
Now, they're planted in, in, uh, in soil inside the greenhouse, but the soil is not very thick. It's maybe about that thick. And uh, so if those tomatoes wanted to go for the rainwater, they had to get down through that soil, through the gravel and into the ground. And so uh, they're not quite as juicy, but they're, they're equally as delicious. These are exactly the same variety, pretty sure anyway. I could be mistaken, but these ones, uh, they're also, the, the, even if they're different varieties, they're heirloom. Um, these ones were on the Shinampa, growing on the ground. And you'll notice that they're, they're not totally ripe. And that's because when they've started to ripen, especially this time of year, I bring them inside to finish ripening so the plant can finish ripening the other ones. Because a lot of our heirlooms, we still have so many and, and they're still so green. Like a lot of them are still very, very green. And so, uh, so I want to, I want to let the plant have more energy to ripen those ones. I highly recommend the heirlooms, uh, but make sure when you're planting your heirlooms, make sure to use companion planting. So this year, and, and I actually, I put a couple of heirlooms in the main garden with the other tomatoes. And I surrounded them with carrots, basil, calendula, lettuce, and sorghum. And uh, they did really well. Uh, we're at the end of the season and um, they're pretty well done those ones too they did get a bit of the blight that's because in this case they got all mixed up with some potatoes that grew unexpectedly and so I got to make sure and the thing is that's the other thing your tomatoes you want to help them to avoid the blight don't plant them right next to your potatoes keep them far away from your potatoes and uh and so, for instance, um, these guys, well, these guys here were also outside in two other spots. No, in three other spots. In a garden where we have our lavender, in another experimental garden we have, and on the Chinampa, Chinampa out back, and none of them got the blight. It was only the ones that were next to the potatoes and were actually intermingling with those these potatoes that that uh, they were volunteers, they're growing on their own. And, so, and but they only got it at the end of the season as well. So there you go. Keep your tomatoes away from your, away from your potatoes to avoid the blight. And use companion planting. Like I said, basil, carrots, lettuce, all those work. Uh, calendula as well as great marigolds is another one. I'll show you in a minute uh, some of the tomatoes in here, and uh, I might uh, harvest uh, harvest some. And uh, I'll also, uh, I'm gonna, maybe I'll cut this one so you can see. I'll cut both of these so you can see inside what they look like. Actually, no, these are too green. I'll cut this one, you can see inside. Some of these ones from inside the greenhouse, they had like in these little bumps here, they were almost like peppers, they were empty. Whereas in the Shinampa, the same, the same variety that was, would be almost this big and it would have those same bumps, it was full of flesh and juice and seeds. But it's like this one, was a, this type is adaptable to its conditions. And because it didn't have as much water and because it was a lot hotter because it was inside the greenhouse, so it got a lot of sun and a lot of heat. So it was able to grow bigger, but because it maybe didn't get as much water, because it didn't get the rain, the direct rain, it had to go down through the gravel to get at, at the rain, uh, down into the ground. So it developed this, this kind of pepper-like uh, um, aspect on the outside bumps. Now on this, in the center part, very f full of nice, thick, delicious, sweet flesh. And on the outside, the, the, you know, very thick as well, fleshy as well. It just, it had these sort of like cavities, which were really interesting. I think I've got some pictures of that, but I, maybe I'll cut this open for you. So let's have a look and see uh, what, what we have inside the greenhouse here. Here's uh, some more of our greenhouse tomatoes. I'm gonna be harvesting this big one because it's about halfway to ripe. And so I'd like, I'd like the plant to have enough energy to, uh, to ripen some other tomatoes around here. And because uh, we got a whole bunch, some really nice ones right here. A couple 
couple ones down here. And like I said, this is, we are October 2nd right now. And we're still got lots of tomatoes. You know, we got these yellow pear ones, which are really beautiful. This one I showed you earlier. It's hanging out by the door here. And the tomatoes are just, they're everywhere. Let me pull this out so you can see. Look at this. This is sort of like the wide angle. They're all over the table. Like there's a table here. And they've, they're all over the top of the table. They're all over the sides. I can't even walk to the other end of the greenhouse. Luckily, I asked for two doors when I had this thing installed. And look, at it goes right up over the lamps and so on. I'm gonna have to be careful that they don't start pulling those down. So yeah, they, we got these yellow pears, which are beautiful. Love these yellow pears. Like I said, I've been growing these since 1990. 30, 30, 34 years. They're wonderful. They're the ones that are, that are just literally all over the place. There were 20 plants in here. And these are the, the Chaplas ones. But they're just literally everywhere. They've grown all the way to the other end. And some of the watermelon have grown all the way to this end. Can't really see them anymore because their, their season's pretty well done. Cutting board. Here we are. So, look at that. Look at that. That's just the first cut. Mmm. Mmm. Oh. That's so sweet. Make sure I save some of this for Magali. Oh, I love it when I can make really thin slices. See that? Look at that. I like to make thin slices so I can make sandwiches with them. Two pieces of toast and a few slices of tomato. That's it. Oh, you could add butter or a bit of lettuce or cucumber, but just tomato and toast. Oh, it's the best. There, look. See those cavities? Look at those cavities. Very interesting. Okay, and it's because these tomatoes didn't get much water. They never watered them, and obviously they didn't get rainwater from above because they're inside the greenhouse. So they just had to go down through the floor of the greenhouse, through that, well, through their thin layer of soil that I gave them, down through the gravel that was beneath that, and then into the soil. Look at that. So it's almost like, you might say it's a pepper, but this cent central area here is very, very thick with flesh. And this, of course, this area is really delicious as well. And so it's quite something. Whereas the, uh, this one, which is the same, it's the, it was from the same plants, from the same uh, seedlings. Uh, now I'm not gonna cut it open because it's not ripe, but it's not gonna have those cavities. You can even just looking at it, it's not as bumpy. It's all flesh, this one from, and it's because this one was growing on the ground on the Shinapa, just sprawling all over the ground. So there it is, there. The rest is for Magali. Look at that, it fills the whole bowl up. You could practically put soup in those in those cavities and eat it like that. So I'm gonna harvest this one. Let me get the knife. There we go. So here this one is. As you can see, it's it's the same variety as this one was, but as you can see, it's also the same as this one. You can see they're essentially the same. This one was just a lot bumpier. Now these ones aren't as ripe, but they'll ripen indoors. I hope you liked the video. Hope you found it useful. If you found it useful, share it with your friends. Make a comment, ask a question. Um, you know, these, these are ways that you can support our channel. I love to answer questions. Uh, I answer all the questions that I get. I respond to all the comments that I get. 
It's love them. Love to hear from you. I love the, the discussion. Sometimes some of you have discussions with each other. It's really great. I learn a lot from, from you guys. I hope you learn a lot from me. Like I said, and if, you know, if you do, then share it. Share it with your friends. I like to uh, make this as easy as possible for because I believe everybody can do this. And so, yeah, so that's how you can support our channel. By sharing, by commenting, by liking. Give it a like. And because uh, all those things, the, the algorithm responds to that and, and sends it out to more people. And uh, we'll have a great week. And we will see you next time.